if we look at dietary influences that have been studied on ulcerative colitis, first of all, as I've mentioned, the incidence is associated with omega-6 fatty acids and with consumption of animal protein, and inversely with omega-3 consumption. The relapse rate in patients who have gone into remission is associated with meat and alcohol consumption, and inversely with consumption of fiber from grains. Specific food intolerances affect fewer than 30% of patients. And enteral feedings may improve nutritional status of patients with ulcerative colitis, but they do not induce remission, they are not directly anti-inflammatory, and they do not raise transforming growth factor beta, the anti-inflammatory cytokine. So it's clearly a different response than in patients with Crohn's disease. There's some interesting research that might explain why patients with ulcerative colitis respond negatively to animal protein. This has to do with a very important nutrient in the colon called butyrate. Butyrate is the principal energy source for the lining of the colon. It also inhibits tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF-alpha, and it increases the stability of tight junctions. Butyrate is produced by bacterial fermentation of carbohydrate and fiber in the colon. It is what is called a short-chain fatty acid. And sulfides have been shown to inhibit the effects of butyrate on the colonic lining. Sulfides are produced by the impact of bacteria on dietary sulfur, which usually comes from protein. Patients with ulcerative colitis have been shown to have elevated levels of sulfate-reducing bacteria in their stool. This would increase sulfate production. And dietary protein also increases sulfide production. The 5-ASA derivatives, as one of their unheralded effects, is the inhibition of bacterial sulfate reductase, which decreases sulfide synthesis. And it's one of the reasons why they may be helpful. When butyrate is added to 5-ASA enemas, it enhances their effectiveness more than the addition of steroids to 5-ASA enemas. If you want to optimize butyrate availability and activity in the colon, from a dietary perspective, you would choose a high fiber, reduced protein diet. So that is the first approach that I take to patients with ulcerative colitis. My first line dietary therapy for mild to moderate ulcerative colitis is avoidance of high omega-6 vegetable oils, a high fiber diet, especially from grains. It's very different from the way that I initially approached Crohn's disease. And there was a study with oat bran that found that 60 grams a day of oat bran supplying 20 grams of dietary fiber increased fecal butyrate by 36% and diminished abdominal pain in individuals with active ulcerative colitis. So this diet is going to be a vegetarian diet or perhaps a pesca-vegetarian diet. And I included fish based upon this study from Norway in which 600 grams a week of Atlantic salmon produced a 50% improvement in the clinical activity index in patients with ulcerative colitis. If the response to this diet is poor, then I will approach patients with ulcerative colitis the way I approach patients who have Crohn's disease. In severe ulcerative colitis, this dietary approach doesn't work. Severe ulcerative colitis is almost like its own entity and can be very scary. There was a very interesting study from, uh, I believe this was UCLA recently, which looked at a fungal connection in severe ulcerative colitis. And this was another gene study. They were looking at a gene that produces a substance called Dectin-1. Dectin-1 is a pattern recognition receptor that's important for innate immune responses against fungi. Mice who lack Dectin-1 have an increased susceptibility to experimental colitis. Their colitis improves when they take fluconazole, an antifungal drug, also known as Diflucan, which is used for treating yeast infections. These researchers found that a polymorphism or an anomaly in the gene in humans for producing Dectin-1 was strongly linked to refractory ulcerative colitis. That's about as far as they took their research. But it reminded me of research that was done in Poland and my own experience in some patients. The Polish researchers found that very high concentrations of yeast 
were strongly affected with active ulcerative colitis that had been present for five years duration. This may be the result of antibiotics or steroids or immune suppressive drugs. This is clearly a secondary phenomenon. They then treated patients with high levels of yeast in the stool. There was a placebo group, there was a group given fluconazole, and there was a group given a particular probiotic called lactobacillus ruteri. And at four weeks, there was clinical endoscopic and histologic improvement in the group given fluconazole or lactobacillus compared to the placebo group, which would suggest that there is a role for yeast or fungi in the maintenance and severity of chronic ulcerative colitis, at least when it's been present for several years. Successful dietary approaches to reducing intestinal yeast usually require limitation of simple sugars and high glycemic index starches. And a diet of this type is something that should be considered in patients with severe ulcerative colitis, especially if there are elevated levels of yeast in the stool. And I do stool tests in these patients that are semi-quantitative, at least, for yeast. And there is more information on the website of the Foundation for Integrative Medicine, it's mdheal.org, and at a website called pilladvice.com, which I created to deal with drug supplement interactions.